you know, we were down there in the summer of 94 for fan week. And that was right when you had your blow up with the pro wrestling torch. So at the Cornet Q and a, which was a big deal. That was one of the big selling points of fan week, you know, four hours of Jim Cornette answering all of our questions, which and really eating cheeseburgers too was part of it or pizza. Uh, so I remember pizza there too, but, um, that really launched a whole shoot interview genre in my eyes. And I was a tape trader. So I think I have a little bit to say about this, but that was the year you went off on the torch. And what none of us realized was just how much shit you were dealing with behind the scenes. Because oh, Jesus. if you look at just a couple months there, you had all the issues with Jake where Jake was your champion. And then Jake <laughs> stopped showing up. Yeah. And we even ran, he even called me after Knoxville. I love you, Jake. But I, I think he's probably has other things to worry about, bigger fish to fry with people telling bad stories on him. But he no-showed Knoxville on Friday night, but then called me afterwards and said he'd definitely be there the next night, which he then no-showed in Johnson City. And then Sunday, we were 12 miles from his house, <laughs> and he didn't make it. <laughs> I never saw him again for fucking uh, two and a half years till he came back to New York. Anyway, go ahead. All of that happens, and then you find someone who you think may possibly be your main event replacement, Conan Chris Walker. A lot of people forget about this. Well, and, and I didn't, I didn't think he was going to be a main event replacement, but I thought he he looked good in in that fucking outfit he wore, and he could get by. Let's stick him in there and see what happens. And he lasted. Did he last a weekend, or was that two nights? I can't even remember why the fuck he took off. But he got on TV. There was the promo with you and him that got on TV. Uh, so that all that happens, you're dealing with all this stuff with Horner, which none of us really knew the extent of it. We knew there was a falling out. I remember Horner was actually at one of the Smoky Mountain shows at Fan Week in 94, the one you weren't at, coincidentally enough, which was the fair show. There was a fair show where the year before Jimmy Del Rey had bungee jumped. And this year, uh, Tammy, Jer the Jefferson County Fair in Morristown, I off the top of my head, I was at another show because we were running two towns that night, I think. That's right. That, that's actually the way I remember it, too. And Horner was there. I, I don't remember if it was his ring or what it was, but Horner all of a sudden was there. Well, I guarantee you he was there because he found out I wasn't and it was fucking six miles from his house. Well, he could make <laughs> it six miles. Jake just couldn't make it 12 miles. <laughs> but none of us knew the extent of what had happened with you and Horner. We just knew he wasn't there and that there was some kind of falling out, but no one knew what. No one knew exactly the extent of everything with Pam Lawson. Like I said last week, a lot of us had dealt with her leading up to fan week, and we also saw when she caused that light stand to fall <laughs> into the crowd, which was, I think there was a kid in a wheelchair right near it. So. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, it was right into the whole kindergarten class. It was just perfect placement. So all of that's going on. Sarah Jericho broke his arm. Jericho broke his arm that, that night. That, I, my, 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 I've brought these guys, Lance Storm and Chris Jericho, in, facilitated getting Lance's paperwork to even work here. Just Chris had dual citizenship. <laughs> found them thinking they're going to be the next fucking sensation in wrestling. And it just, it was, they were, but it was a little longer than I thought it was, or it was going to be. I bring them in. I fucking feed them well done to get them over. And then I bring the heavily bodies back for the biggest week of shows. We're going to gross it that much in a week as we have the previous, like three fucking months with Knoxville sold out and all that other shit. And the very first time he's going to get in the ring with him, he breaks his arm that afternoon practicing. That was perfect too. So all of that happens, and of course, like I said before, the pro wrestling torch and you start going at it. All of this is in the air. All of this is happening leading into, I think it was September, or maybe the end of August, when this Casey O'Connor incident happens. Oh, good. Uh, and, and let me preface this by saying that I'm going to disappoint anybody that wants to hear me just really just ream somebody out like I did fucking Horner last week, although he deserves it. <laughs> and Casey did a few things to deserve it, but actually I've been in contact with Casey O'Connor. He'll probably hear this. Hopefully he'll hear it. Uh, over the last couple months, and we exchanged a couple of nice emails about Brian Hildebrand and – uh, with the benefit of, and I even teased it last week, with the benefit of 20-something years of, of, of time passing, I've come to realize probably KC meant well, but he was way in the wrong place at exactly the wrong time listening to the wrong fucking people. And basically what happened was, once again, not only am I paying many of these people, wrestlers and horners alike, um, out of my pocket in some instances – when I'm covering shit that we're short on from uh, our investment from Rick Rubin, 
I'm dealing with these fucking people that are supposed to be friends, such as this fucking idiot that is at the Pro Wrestling Torch. I don't speak his name to this day. He can go fucking burst in spontaneous fucking flames for all I give a shit. Who I'd done business with and was friendly to that then goes on a goddamn <laughs> crusade about, oh, I shouldn't, Cornette shouldn't have done this and I shouldn't have said that or whatever the fuck. And in doing so, starts printing shit that is basically false, completely baseless, what I'm trying to say, and was read by the son of a TV state executive where we were trying to get on the fucking air in Roanoke, Virginia. But he said, oh, my son read that Smoky Mountain Wrestling is going out of business about a year and a half before we actually went out of business. So the fucker, fucker cost us TV clearance because he didn't know what he was fucking talking about. Anyway, <clears throat> with all that going on, we're in Beckley, West Virginia, one weekend. After all these other things have transpired, and any time you're in Beckley, it's not exactly a celebration. <laughs> And you have a history with Beckley. And uh, yes, that is where we got one of the biggest lawsuits in history, uh, the biggest lawsuit in history of pro wrestling in Beckley. Stan actually punched a fucking guy, not me. I just cussed him. Anyway, it, the house was the shits. We had a TV station there, our WOAY in Oak Hill. It was a fucking ABC affiliate, I believe. Uh, we had a good time slot on Saturday nights, but we couldn't get him to come to Beckley for whatever reason. So it was a crummy house. I go out and I, I think I got beat up because I was wrestling. And when we come back, I realize somebody from the ring side area has stolen my tennis racket. And we're on the way. Actually, I'm going straight to the TV taping. I, there was somewhere in, in Western Virginia the following day. I said, fuck, now I got to go find a fucking racket. And KC comes up and says, oh, I got one in my trunk. I said, why do you have a racket in your trunk? And then he's, his face fell. He's like, well, that was the one you gave me to send Bill after. What? That was the one you gave me to send Bill after six weeks ago for his contest that I promised him in the magazine, a racket, right? Casey had <laughs> been a fan forever. And he was one of the Greensboro guys. And he was a great kid who, when he got out of high school, he came over and hung out and said, I want to be in the wrestling business. And do you have a job for me? And as it actually Casey, no, we really don't. But at the same time, Sandy Scott was overworked. He was the guy that booked all the buildings, dealt with all the, the spot show sponsors for all the spot shows, basically our operations guy. I said, boy, it would take a lot off Sandy if he didn't have to go to all these towns and fucking deliver the posters and the flyers and tell the people how to, how to do them, how to, how to promote, where to put them and shit. Uh, the promotional guy that we've written up. If he didn't have to fucking run some of these other errands or if I didn't have to go down to the goddamn um, uh, production company and just pick up tapes and shit, just spend an hour and a half or two hours in the car going there and back to do whatever the fuck. KC, you want to be the errand guy, the office stooge <clears throat> for whatever amount per week. I won't embarrass him by telling the people how much he was making. But he said yes, because he asked me a job for a job and I created one for him that nobody was in it. Right. And he lived at the Smoky Mountain Flop House where he actually he stayed with Brian Hildebrand for a while. And this was subject to one of our emails because I thought that Brian had rented the Flop House. But actually, Casey and, uh, and maybe Jimmy Del Rey were living with Brian until Brian got involved with his future wife, at which point that it got crowded. So they went and got the Flop House where then Jericho and a variety of the guys would stay. And, and he was living there and he was a high school kid and he had, you know... Had job in the wrestling business, but then the problem became, and and I'm going to speak more to him about this. Uh, but the problem became, we kept hearing, well, shit's late, or he didn't get to sponsors until three o'clock in the afternoon, or you know, the guys would say, well, KZ, well, he doesn't usually get up before noon, or whatever the fuck. And Sandy Scott would come to me complaining, so I, 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 I KC. Then I would go to KC and say, KC, Sandy's complaining, blah blah blah, and he'd have an excuse. But it, it was getting irritating right but i'm protecting kc from sandy bitching about him because <clears throat> i on the other side i could see that sandy didn't particularly like anybody that didn't get up at six o'clock in the morning and work for 18 hours straight and and com not complain when you flipped them some cheerios so i was trying to keep the peace but then finally i had so many complaints and i'd go talk to kc and then sandy complain or somebody else would say something and then KC tells me himself, well, that tennis racket you gave me six weeks ago, I forgot to mail it out for you, like you said. I said, fuck it, you're done. Fuck. What the fuck? So I kicked him out of fucking Beckley and fired him. And but then about literally maybe a month later, I don't know, some time passed. 
Oh, and, and I, I, I tell a lie. And then there was a show that we did in Marietta at the Cobb Civic Center a week or two later. And Casey had ridden down with some of the guys that, you know, was staying in the, in the apartment they had over there. And we didn't have a ring announcer because KC had said, basically, he was mad at me after I fired him. Well, I want my fucking money. I said, well, you only work part of the fucking week. And then when they found the stack of posters and flyers in the closet at the flop house that hadn't been handed out, which was 90 something dollars and everything, I said, we're fucking even as of this point, KC, I fucking paid you sometimes out of my own pocket. You cost me this fucking money. This shit's sitting around here. We're fucking even for this amount of money. So then goddamn, uh, he comes to Marietta with the guys, and we didn't have a ring announcer. Somebody, Brian Hildebrand said, well, KC's out there. I said, all right, tell him <laughs> if he'll ring announce for us tonight, because I knew he wanted to move back home to North Carolina. I said, I'll give him a payoff, and I'll give him some money to goddamn go home to North Carolina. And the word I got when it was delivered back in the locker room was Casey says he ain't going to do shit unless you pay him all that money. He says he owes you plus pay or you owe him plus paid him for fucking announcing tonight. I said, well, then tell him to fuck himself and I'll find somebody else that I did. And that was the last communication I had with KC until whatever time later, I realized that Kenny Bolin, old star maker, he'll be glad he got mentioned on this week's show. Star Maker had given me, well, it didn't give me, but he sold me a VHS video camera that I'd had for a few years that I actually had loaned to Casey O'Connor because they wanted to record some stuff. He said, you have a video camera, not the one we use for the matches, right? I said, yes. I said, here. So I'd loaned it to him three or four months beforehand. And I realized that he'd never give it back to me. So <clears throat> I called over to that apartment because I knew that now they had said KC had gone to Colorado for vacation or whatever. So I called over the apartment. I said, hey, whoever I talked to, was it Anthony Michaels? Regardless. I said, did KC before he left, did he leave a camcorder in a blue metal case over there? And the response I got was, well, I don't know, but you can ask him. I said, what is, where, where is he? Oh, he's right here. So I got on the phone with him. I said, KC, I said, do you have my, still have my camcorder? Yep. Got it right here. I said, can I come over and get it? Only if you bring me my money. I said, KC, <laughs> this is not the fucking time to be doing this. I, I loaned you that camcorder as because we were personal friends away from business. And I told you that the money you cost me and the aggravation that you cost me was worth the amount of money that I owed you for the part of the last week that you worked. We were going to be even. Trust me on this. The camcorder is a separate deal. I loaned it to you. All I want to do is get it back. I don't even have to see you and you don't have to deal with me, but I want the goddamn camcorder. You just set it out on the front porch. And I'll come over and pick it up. Not unless you bring me my money. All right, KC, how about this? I, this is pretty much verbatim. The, the way the conversation went, I am coming over to get that fucking camcorder and I'm coming away with that camcorder, whether you want me to or not. And I ain't going to give you any goddamn money. I will be over there very shortly. Please make the wise decision. Click. And I go over to fucking KC's <laughs> and as I'm pulling up Anthony Michaels and, and I can't remember who else, well, one of the other boys, they were pulling out in their car. Like they were going to go down the driveway and go somewhere. I said, I pull up in front of them. They couldn't get by. I said, where are you guys going? Oh, we're just going down to the store. Well, I didn't know maybe the camera was in the car, right? So I said, well, you just, the store's right down there at the bottom of the driveway. Why don't you just walk and it'll be shorter? Because that way I won't have to move my car. Okay, so they got out of there. There, Casey opens up the door. I said, Casey, I said, just set the camcorder down. I'm fucking weary of all of this with everybody. Set the camera down. I'll come over and get it and we will part friends. You got my money? I later found out, because I don't want to leave this out, that one of the boys who shall remain nameless had instructed KC, you know, if you let them fuck you around in this business, you, then they won't have any respect for you, so always get your money. Oh, and this, the, Yeah. <laughs> this was the advice that this person had given, and I didn't know this at the time. So once that I was told this, I softened up on KC a little bit. I went to the trunk of my car, and I got out to bat, and I said, KC, I'm standing next to your fucking car. I said, I have a baseball bat. I said, set the camcorder down on the porch, close the door. I'll get it and I'll leave and go home. He closes the door with the camcorder inside. I'm yelling, Casey, 
one chance, one more chance. He opens the door again, I think. I said, one more chance or I will clear every piece of glass out of this car that's sitting here right now. He closes the door and he picks up the phone and he starts fucking in the window, right? So you can see he starts fucking like he's calling the cops. Cops ain't going to get there in 20 seconds and I'm standing right next to that motherfucker, right? I said, all right, I've been waiting for this chance to do something like this, KC. That was my exact words because I was fed up with Tim Horner. I was fed up with Pam Lawson. I was fed up with fucking pro wrestling torch guy. I was fed up with fucking the whole goddamn lot of everybody that I was financing and paying for and trying to fucking keep in control of or whatever the fuck. And I aired his car out every, every, the windshield, the back windshield, the side windows, the rear view mirrors, the headlights, the taillights. If it was glass or plastic on that car, it no longer existed. And then I fucking got in the car and drove off (laughs) and (laughs) because it was, it was Sunday night. And I wasn't going to go to jail and sit in jail in fucking Hamblin County in Morristown, goddamn Tennessee on a Sunday night. So I just fucking drove to Knoxville, which is right across the county line. And I checked into a hotel days in and had HBO uh, where I goddamn knew that they weren't going to know where to look for me, nor were they going to take it that far on a Sunday evening anyway. Called my wife and uh, and said, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be home till tomorrow. <laughs> which they did come to the house. They, they came to the house a couple of times that night looking for me. Um, and like I, and telling her like, well, if he shows up, give us a call. Like she's going to stooge. She's like, yeah, she balled it up and threw it down, the piece of paper with the fucking number and threw it in front of the fucking guy. Yeah, I'm going to do that. You fucking idiot. And the next morning I called a fucking lawyer and went up there and met him. And he took me over to the jail and fingerprint the whole nine yards and boom. And then I got a lawyer Fucking represent me to the goddamn uh, assault of property or whatever, destruction of private property, and ended up paying Casey, I think it was about four grand for repairing everything on his car and and what he missed out when he couldn't go to goddamn Colorado for the next week or two while he was sticking glass back at his car. And then, and then we really didn't have any contact for a while after that. But, it, and of course, it made the newspaper in Morristown because I, when I lived in Morristown, the headline of the Morristown Citizen Tribune on the front page one day was new stoplight installed at mall. I'm not shitting you. I saved it. <laughs> so it made the paper, but I just left a message on the machine because I, that's when I actually, I was going to Atlanta the follow that, that day after I got out of jail to shoot interviews with uh, Ole Anderson's son, Bryant for him to come in. So I left a message on my answer machine. If anybody called that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I swear, I have no idea what happened to Casey O'Connor's car. I believe it was done by a one-armed man. (laughs) And (laughs) and the article said, this is believed to be a reference to the TV show, the fugitive (laughs) whose uh, star was innocent of the charge of murdering his wife and claimed that it had been done by a sweaty one-armed intruder. (laughs) So anyway, that's, that's, that's about what that was. And, and once again, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time following wrong advice because a, I would give him some money in Marietta if he hadn't been prickish about it, but he was following the wrong advice. And B, if he'd given me the fucking camcorder and probably called me the next day or two and said, Hey, I can't afford to get home. I would probably done something for him there. And Dr. Tom, I will say this. He also told me, Dr. Tom said, if you need some money to get home, I'll give it to you. Don't press the issue and give him some time to cool off. Cause doc knew that all these fucking lunatics. I mean, a lot of the guys knew what a fucking idiot Horner was even, but remember Bobby blaze told you on the six Oh five that, uh, he remembered when Horner just came in the baby face locker room one night for no apparent reason said, well, you know, the office is going to start taking 28% of your merchandise money. That's right. Fucking goof. <laughs> so, you know, doc was trying to just let the thing blow over and somebody else who shall remain nameless, who I, I'm on actually good terms with it to this day <laughs> I said, no, I'll make sure you can't let him screw you. Well, he, you know, anyway, I got, you know, uh, I got a million uh, dollars worth of publicity and a couple of good stories out of it, but uh, we've moved on since then. So I'm not going to tear Casey apart. He was acting on some bad advice on a number of things as he told me anyway. Well, a few things before we put this to bed in the midst of all of this, you promote the biggest show you ever promoted the night of legends, which what was a $40,000 gate. 
Um, actually, it was the second biggest because the next year, the Super Bowl of wrestling, I think, beat it by like f- f- a few thousand dollars or whatever. But to that point, yes, that point. also, and it was my favorite also. Yeah, we did uh, 4,000 some people. We did 40 grand and, and 4,000 some people. I can't remember off the top of my head. That'll be in the book. But yes. Yeah, in the midst of all with, this, you have the biggest with, show. With no WWF talent. We had uh, imports like Road Warrior Hawk was in the main event and the Funk Brothers. Um, and, and, uh, of course that, well, the heavenly bodies came down from the W, but we had no other WWF talent. And really I looked at them like Smoky mountain guys. So the following year, yes, we beat it with Shawn Michaels and in an intercontinental title match. And I think that's the one with undertaker was on that one too, but yeah. night of legends was just with homegrown Tennessee guys and some good old NWA talent. I didn't realize until you just laid it out like you did that, you know, so August 5th is the Night of Legends, and that's the night Pam Lawson, after all of her bullshit, gets fired because of the, you know, almost killing people with the light stand falling over. Yes, yes. KC <laughs> was fired. Tempted fan slaughter. <laughs> KC was fired just two days later. I didn't realize until you laid it out, I was at that show in Beckley. Oh, shit, was that that same weekend? Because the next day, you said the TV taping was the next day in Virginia. Oh, there you go. The 7th was Beckley, the 8th was Saltville, Virginia for the TV taping. Go. It was bad timing on KC's part all the way around. Yeah. And and one last thing, you know, everyone always hears now, and not many people knew it in the back in the day, that Rick Rubin was behind Smoky Mountain Wrestling financially. But for all this going on, things that are costing the company money, you had money in the company too. It wasn't like you just had a financial backer and you didn't put any of your own money in. All yeah, so- no, I was I was coming up, I was covering all the fucking shortcomings. Of when fucking stupid people would do stupid things that cost us extra money that we hadn't planned on, I was covering it. I had, by the time the fucking run was over, I had six figures in it. So that explains. I, I, I ended up getting my fucking money back eventually by selling those prized tapes to uh, the WWE Network. But yet, yeah, no, it wasn't like I'm just, oh, we'll try to do better next time. No, motherfucker. In some cases, I've been paying you out of my pocket to fuck me. So fuck you.